Thank you, Olivia, for that fantastic introduction. We're really excited to be here, and I'm just thrilled to uh, be a part of this panel today and, and really talk about uh, innovation. You know, I think that a lot of people, when they they think, you know, in the Wayback Machine, innovation was a couple of folks in a garage somewhere or tinkering with ideas. And one of the great things about this panel is we have individuals who are here really innovating at scale. And how they're innovating is, is, is somewhat different. So what I wanted to start with is um, maybe just quickly have each of the panelists talk a little bit about their role, because they're coming at it from different perspectives. But then we'll talk about the approaches that, that they're taking in their companies. And Ernesto, why don't we start with you? And we'll go to Goran and then Simon. I am Chief Innovability Officer. I won the award at Davos for the strangest title in the business ecosystem. Chief Innovability because we have mixed innovation and sustainability. So I lead all innovation activities at Eternal Group at global level and all activities aimed at making Enel more sustainable. And sustainability and innovation are embedded in the business activities. So I manage people in every function, in every department, in every business line, and also in the digital department too. Fantastic. And Goran. Hi, well, uh, hello everyone. So I'm, uh, I'm leading innovation from a digital and technology perspective. So I'm part of the global IT leadership team. I report into the CIO and I'm looking at what are the technology trends and industry trends and how they apply to our brands, our markets, our enterprise, our manufacturing, and then have a structured process looking into how can we bring that into the organization? How can we scale and industrialize where, where, it, where it makes sense? So I do not make new food. I do not uh, cover anything that is the core food and beverage uh, renovation innovation of, uh, of, of Nestle. Great, and Simon. So innovation is one of the, core values of Salesforce. So frankly, everybody in, in Salesforce is charged with innovating. So I report into the office of the CEO and are really focused on kind of the, the headlights on the company, looking at where we're going and then how do we help our customers get there? So I spend a lot of time looking at kind of the future of work, the future of selling, sustainability, but also the issues that our customers are facing uh, and, and what they're doing and kind of triangulating all of that. So, I, I spent the last couple of days getting really smart on, on how your uh, companies are innovating. And what struck me is, is there's really different approaches and kind of philosophies even about, about innovation. So um, Ernesto, I wanted to start with you because you know what you your organization did was kind of peel off innovation and put it into a, into a separate, almost an isolated group. Talk a little bit about that approach and why that worked for you. We have not an isolated approach. We have in innovation and sustainability embedded in every department, in every business line, in every function. So I have people managing innovation in the legal department, in the audit department, in the communication department, in the uh, financial department, in the HR department. And we have, we have people managing innovation in the global business line. We generate energy, we distribute energy, we, say, we sell energy in the business lines, aimed at those activities, we have people managing innovation. And those people are managed by me and by the global head of such functions or business lines. In this way, all the tools that I manage, such as the innovation hubs to look for startups or the crowdsourcing activities or the design thinking activities or the agile and creativity techniques and all the other stuff that I can, that I can use as a support for my colleagues are joined with the business lines people because business line people who are managing innovation, they report to me and to the global head of these business lines or functions. And I have just one boss at Eternal that is my CEO. And the second boss that is more important, even more important is the customer, yeah. obviously. And the other stakeholders are the other bosses, the NGOs, or the or the the shareholders and the other ones, and uh, it's amazing because we are connecting these activities with the sustainability activities. So how can we innovate to be 
a more sustainable company? How can we innovate to, to, uh, to uh, transform our ecosystem into a more sustainable ecosystem with the support of people outside the company, the small startups or the big companies? And uh, I, when you manage a relationship with a startup, it's easier. But when you have to talk to Salesforce and you have to say, hey, we must create something new. You are a giant. We are another giant, 90 billion company, no? Value. So uh, uh, we can't think I am the boss and you must do what I say. And the other ones cannot say I'm the boss, you have to do what I say. It's a, like a marriage, you know? respecting the other one and being respected is a way to innovate together. And uh, so I say that we cannot have, a, we cannot pursue a strategy. We can just pursue a strategy. The starting point of our journey, of our strategy journey that we can a lead together with small companies and with huge giants such as Salesforce that is an innovation partner of us. So, so it is more like built into the, the fabric of the organization. And, and that actually kind of leads into a, a question for Simon, because you talked about innovation being one of the core values of, of Salesforce. I used to work at Salesforce, very familiar with the, the strategic planning process of the, the V2 mom, the vision values, methods, obstacles, and measures. So, so this is a culture that the innovation culture is one that has has sustained over the 20 plus years of, of Salesforce. How do you keep that culture? And, and how, how do you bring in individuals into the organization that, that really maintain that sense of innovation? It's a great question. <clears throat> and, and just to give you some context, so Salesforce, 22 years old, we've been growing at 20, over 20% year over year uh, for those 22 years. And you can't do that by just looking at the world incrementally. How do we take what we did last year and make it a bit better? So we're constantly looking at the world with a beginner's mind. And, and that's something that our CEO, Mark Benioff, uses regularly as a phrase. And what that means is that every, at the beginning of every year, we're really looking at what we have to achieve and what our customers are telling us we need to achieve for them, and exactly back to Ernesto's point, the kind of the customer is the CEO in that sense, and going, what do we need to do? And we build our plan, which Kirsten, you just said, our V2 model, what, are our, what is our vision, what are our values, how are we gonna achieve this, our methods, what will prevent us our obstacles and how will we measure if we're successful, our measures. And, and that plan then kind of cascades from the top down throughout the whole organization. So that we, 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 we approach the planning kind of with those fresh eyes and then we cascade it down and we ensure that everybody's then aligned to it. So there's kind of, the, the, the planning side, but also the alignment side, and they both work very, very closely together. The point though, the key in all of this though, is that we don't do any of that planning without the voice of the customer being completely resident in all of it, because it's actually the customer that determines everything. It's, if we're not relevant, then, then we're, we're dead. Um, so how do we be relevant? We listen to the customer, understand what their needs are. That then shapes everything about how we organize ourselves, our resources, um, our product roadmap um, and, and the year ahead. So that's kind of how we work. Now, the, the other challenge with that is that if you just listen to the customer and the customer tells you what, what they want, then you're, you, you effectively sometimes end up with faster horses. So we've got to be very careful at trying to understand what it is that the customers are actually trying to do. And that's led us to get much, much, much closer to our customers like an like Nestle. And, and it's working with them tightly that allows us to build a better picture of what our customers are going through, what the markets are doing. We spend a lot of time now, for example, doing scenarios because COVID has shown us just how much variability, there is no such thing as a clear, absolute view of what the future is. So we've got to kind of figure out what that means. So we're, we're doing everything we can to really make sense of what our customers' markets are, what our customers' needs are, and then kind of parlay that back into, uh, into our planning, approach that with a beginner's mind, and then execute with a really, really clear uh, um, and aligned uh, team. Excellent. And, and Goran, 
Uh, what I was really impressed by is Nestle is such a large company. And one of the ways that you really bring innovation in is through partnerships. There's a lot of different programs that you're, you're focused on the customer, but your partners are helping you innovate to, to bring um, new products to life. Can you talk a little bit about the, the partnership programs and how you, how you use those in the innovation strategy? Yes, so Nestle, Nestle believes strongly in the in the open innovation model, and uh, we rely on our network of partners, uh, both in in food and beverage uh, uh, product innovation, but also on the on the technology side. Uh, what what is interesting for me in this discussion and, and listening listening to you and Nestle and Simon is that we we talk we all talk about innovation. We all talk about uh, how we bring new products to market, how do we stay relevant, how we make sure that what we put in front of our customers and consumers is really innovative and the best that we can offer. But for me, what the, the thought that comes to my mind is how do we split innovation between what is short-term horizon one, horizon two, and horizon three? Well, who, I fully agree that innovation is fully embedded in what we do on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, 31% of Nestle portfolio gets re-innovated every year and improved to serve our customers better. But that doesn't mean that we have innovated out of this world moonshots year after year to bring them to market, which stays significantly more, more difficult. So for me, the, the having a, a very decentralized organization where you have to drive innovation to go beyond short-term gains to get to a point where you can inspire the organization, explain to them what are the opportunities coming from the outside, uh, be in a position to test prototype and understand what the value of those uh, outside in innovations and then eventually if they succeed, be able to scale, that's, that's a big challenge. And for me, the, the key partners for us in that journey on the technology side is really relying on on the startup ecosystem, working very closely with the with the with the VCs, understanding where the money is going, understanding what is that next trend coming up, so we are in a position to get ready uh, and then and then uh, test and scale where where appropriate. So I think there was a big shift in. So we do work with our partners, which is uh, Nestle has strategically defined partners that that we work with in both food and and uh, and technology that we leverage and use and and embark together on the on the co-innovation journeys and and bring new things to to the consumers but also looking beyond that in what's happening in the in the startup ecosystem and what's happening in the VC ecosystem and since this is uh, the Israel Dealmaker Summit, we probably have a lot of folks that are in, our, in the audience who are innovators and they are uh, perhaps looking for uh, for the way to become the innovation engine or the uh, the next innovation for one of the companies that you are working for. I'd love for each of you to talk about how does M&A play? I mean, Goran, we'll start with you because you basically touched on it. You know, specifically, how does M&A play in your innovation strategy? What, what, do, what do you plan in this space um, from an acquisition perspective? So, so already in terms of presence and and being being at the at the right place at the right time, uh, my team is present in 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 Silicon Valley innovation uh, ecosystem, and that's that's where I happen to be based. We have recently opened an uh, an innovation outpost in in Tel Aviv, and uh, and very happy to be able to bring uh, bring innovation from there. Uh, we have a huge hub in in Barcelona. I have some presence in Latam in Mexico City. So we manage to keep a rather good pulse of what's going around in the world, understand what's that innovation, and then try to try to bring it in. On the M and A side, it, it uh, my team is getting involved in more and more due diligence exercises than uh, than it's been the case a couple of years ago. But um, but for us, uh, we really look from the from the. Uh, innovation perspective and from the technology perspective, how those companies would contribute and fit into the existing the ecosystem of, of Nestle. Nestle is very good on M&A in terms of food, beverages, and investing in the in, um, in companies where manufacturing uh, products. And there's a lot of examples, that, and I won't go in, in details, but on the technology side, uh, the things are picking up and, and, and looking really good going forward. Ernesto, how are you looking at uh, at M and A? 
M&A is an opportunity, but I can share with you some figures. In the last five years, we have analyzed more or less 10,000 startups. And uh, on those 10,000 startups, we have selected 1,500 for a deep analysis with uh, a con a continuous interaction with the, the manager of the startups to identify concrete projects. We have launched with them more than 800 projects. We have scaled up just only uh, 95 projects, and we have bought only three companies. So from 10,000 to three companies, because we think that uh, if you want to pursue a real open innovation, buying companies is not being open. If I buy a company, it becomes part of the body of the company. So this is not pursuing open innovation. It's buying company to pursue closed innovation transforming what was outside into what is inside. No, but pursuing open innovation is respecting the startups, valorizing the startups, adopting their products and services, hosting in our labs, mm -hmm. and finding them through our hubs. And the first hub that we have created was in Tel Aviv. And we have a network of 10 physical hubs in Tel Aviv, in Rio de Janeiro, in Santiago del Chile, in Boston, in San Francisco, in Madrid, in Moscow, and uh, in Pisa, Milan, Milan, and, and, uh, and Catania. But we have other digital hubs, such as the one that we have in Canada, and in Berlin, Paris, and London. And, and two, two, um, uh, two times a year, we go to Australia to check, to look for startups. But what do we do? We host startups in our labs. We have 21 labs and two labs in Israel. We are very proud. One in Beersheba, FinSec and Cybersecurity, and the other one is uh, uh, on the city of the future in, uh, in, um, in Haifa. And we host startups, we work with them, we find solutions, we help them, we get challenges from them, we share our challenges, we create with them something new, we buy the products, we put them in contact with the VCs, and it's plenty of VCs with a lot of money for the startups that are working with Enel because Enel today is the larger producer of renewable in the world. We are the leader in North America, South America, South Africa, Australia, so it's plenty of VCs. So being open is adopting the soul of the startups. Pursuing, uh, leveraging their passion, their willingness, their commitment, their dreams. We want to share and make that, those dreams come true. And Simon, we'll let you have the last word on this. Um, Salesforce not only acquires startups, they acquire very large companies as evidenced uh, by some of your more recent with uh, Tableau and Slack. So, so where does M&A play um, for Salesforce? It plays a big role uh, for Salesforce. I mean, we look at we have a balanced portfolio across organic and inorganic organic growth. But to put this also in the context of Israel, Israel actually is probably our best market in EMEA for um, for us to find startups that we've that we've invested in. And Salesforce Ventures is very very busy. Um, in Israel doing just that. And I think there's over 20 companies that we've invested in in Israel over the last few years. Um, we've also got our Tel Aviv R&D center, so we're kind of on the ground in, um, in Israel. But I think the other thing, the way of looking at, um, at this is, it's not just about Salesforce acquiring companies in, it's also about and investing in them through Salesforce Ventures. It's also about the platform that we have, this app, this largest basic marketplace for companies where you can come and join the marketplace and then effectively use Salesforce as a platform to grow your business that way, which may lead you to being acquired later by us or by even by, by um, our customers. So I think there's, there's layers and layers and layers of ways to get involved and get your, your brand out there into the Salesforce marketplace as a way of, of um, triggering your, uh, your growth. Sustainability, every one of you has said sustainability in some way, shape or form. Um, are those activities primarily organic around sustainability? Simon, we'll start with you. Um, how are you looking to bring sustainability into your innovation? 
Uh, this is an enormously important topic and one I'm spending a lot of time on right now. Uh, it's imperative for the world. We are not organized to hit 1.5 degrees, um, and we've got to put a lot of effort in. Every organization does. So we're innovating inside Salesforce in terms of how we operate ourselves. We're a net zero company, but we can do even more. But it's also now about how we help our customers. We've built the sustainability cloud that was organically built inside Salesforce, but when we're partnering with Accenture now and, and others, on it, but the key thing for us is going to be working with our customers um, to help them innovate around this area. And then Salesforce's roadmap will effectively be shaped by our customers around sustainability. But this is a really, really big and important growth area. All right, well, unfortunately we are out of time. Maybe our next panel discussion can be on sustainability and innovation. I thank you gentlemen all for just really rich conversation and a lot of the great ideas you brought forth today. So thank you.